What exactly is investigative psychology? Investigative psychology is a form of applied psychology. That means it is psychology that can be applied to solve real-world problems. Investigative psychology tries to understand offenders' behavior and the decisions they took so that this understanding can be used to assist in the investigation of crimes. It is also about how best to investigate and how the police make decisions when they deal with crime so it looks at both the offender and the police. The term investigative psychology was first coined by Professor David Kanter in 1994, who had been studying environmental psychology and then found a link between an offender's spatial behaviors and their cognitive map, which is a person's awareness of where they live, frequent and pass through. I will take you through some of the main areas of investigative psychology in this series. Welcome. Investigative psychology is based on the scientific method of identifying patterns and commonalities across a range of offenders' behaviors. So, when an offender made certain decisions whilst they were committing a crime, we can try to find out what other offenders who made similar decisions in similar situations had in common with each other. This could be their gender, age range, their relationship to the victim or the location, or their previous criminal experience, for example. We can then say that it is likely that the offender we're looking for perhaps also has that particular aspect in common with these other offenders that have already been caught for similar crimes. If you are an experienced investigator, have you noticed that people who commit certain kinds of offenses have something in common with each other? What was it? Let's work through an example. To establish a pattern that might help in investigations, researchers looked at a large number of different offences that were already solved. The symbols within each offence represent an offence feature, for example, was it a robbery or a rape? Was it committed outdoors or indoors? Was it committed by a stranger or someone known to the victim? Was violence used simply to get the victim to comply or was it used because the offender really wanted to be that violent? There are many other potential offence features, so this is just a small sub-selection. Researchers then selected one of those offence features and looked at offenders who had been convicted to see what those whose crimes exhibited that same offence feature had in common with each other. This, again, might have been their gender, age range, previous criminal experience or specific mental health problem, for example. Now, based on this connection between the offence feature and the perpetrator feature, we can infer that the unknown offender that we're looking for has some of these same features in common with other perpetrators. This could give investigations a starting point for their inquiries. In fact, the more similar certain features of the crime are, the more similar some of the background characteristics of the offenders who have committed those crimes are likely to be. We call this homology, which means sameness. For example, in a case where an offender decides to commit an outdoor rape of a woman he doesn't know, which we call a stranger rape, it has been established through previous outdoor stranger rape cases that he is likely to have a generally criminal lifestyle and to have previous convictions for a range of offenses, not just those of a sexual nature. That is the pattern that has been identified from a large number of previous outdoor stranger rape offenses and those who commit them. If you are dealing with such a rape case then, make sure you don't limit your initial searches to only sexual offenders. Your perpetrator might not be on that list. However, a man who commits a stranger rape and then kills the woman deliberately, by that I mean not through panic or escalation, is likely to have an actual conviction for rape. Once the investigating team know this, they can prioritize the list of potential suspects to start with convicted rapists. However, they should never exclude a potential suspect from their investigations just because they don't have a rape conviction. And there are two reasons for that. One, it is actually quite difficult to get a conviction for a rapist, which means that there are many rapists out there 
who have not been convicted for this offense. And two, investigative psychology deals with probabilities like any other social science and cannot state in absolute terms that the offender we're looking for definitely has a particular attribute. It is just more or less likely based on other similar cases. Therefore, investigative psychology is to be used as intelligence and guidance, but cannot be used as evidence for or against anyone. Research carried out on serial killers found that the most common factor that led to the apprehension of the offender was the knowledge that they had been involved in a previous crime. So this information on previous criminal history could be very useful. That is because if they have a conviction, they are on a police database. How do you make these comparisons between what you can glean from a crime scene and what you can find out about previous offenders who have behaved in a similar way? Unfortunately, most of that information is not accessible to normal practitioners. One of the main sources of such case information is the Vitlas database, the Violent Crime Linkage Analysis System. This is a database of violent crime devised and maintained by the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Many other countries subscribe to it as well, and it enables investigators to pass on very detailed information that is known on a crime, which is then fed into the database. It can then be analyzed how common certain behaviors are, whether the crime might be linked to another case on the database, and what is known about individuals who exhibit certain behaviors that have been input onto the database. The other way you could find out about research is through academic journals but most of them are not accessible for free, and those who can access them are mainly staff or students at universities. I'm sorry this is bad news, but that's one of the reasons why Dr. IPIP came into existence. I will pass on relevant articles and pieces of research I come across to everyone who has an interest in it for free.